Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rotor World Football Show. It's Thursday, April 11th. I am Patrick Doherty, joined by Mr. Denny Carter and Mr. Kyle Dvorak and Mr. Mock Draft 2.0, or is it 3.0 or 4.0? We've lost track, but Kyle is posting another mock draft on rotorworld.com. We're going to break it down in forensic detail. Now, we were talking forensic because there's nothing else to talk about. <laughs> um, <laughs> literally nothing else to talk. I'm like learning guards and stuff. Finally, man. Yeah, I'm actually begging the NFL to make one thing happen so we can talk about it. Well, how, that's CJ Uzama erasure. Sure, I don't actually remember what team he signed with, but I know did he sign with the team? He did. He signed with the team today. Uh, I genuinely don't know who. I forgot. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I was I was deep in the <laughs> which guard or the Cowboys mm-hmm. going to take sauce. I didn't see any of um, you could have told me like, you know, Aaron Rodgers got cut and retired. Uh, I wouldn't have seen it, dude. I'm not. You guys that. didn't know that CJ Ozama signed with the Eagles. I mean, this is honestly kind of pathetic. I, I did. Oh, There's that's no not way good to for know. Albert O. That's bad for Albert O. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, stop with the Albert O. Oh. I was, wasn't entirely accurate. There's one other thing to talk about. The Texans offense. The Texans actually did something. Why don't the other teams actually do something? Yeah, please. Danny's going to have one final check-in on the Texans and what we hope is going to be a new-look offense post yes. Stefan Diggs. Uh, so we'll get to that in the second half of the show. To, I mean, we usually riff. I mean, I could talk about the Masters. I could talk about yeah. Shai Otani's uh, interpreter being the single, not just the worst gambler of all time, the worst criminal of all time. <laughs> and just like literally saying in text, like, yep, did a crime. And the FBI, like, easily obtaining those texts. <laughs> And then implicating him. Yeah, he uh, crime. he lacks that dog uh, that most criminals have. I think. Well, he's got the betting dog. I mean, how much do you think this man? I feel bad that this guy got caught before the Masters. He needed to go out with one final bang. Ah. Like I'm betting on Jordan Spieth. You know what? Screw it. He is still a good golfer. He's gonna show, and he's four over. And it's not even <laughs> After two one. Over yeah, exactly. Yeah. And. Uh, it is too bad he didn't get to bet on this year's Masters, Denny Carter. Yeah, um, he could have. He could have put all his money on Austin Eckro, like I did. And is that uh, a I real person? Doing... Stop. Oh, it is. It is because Denny and I were down horrific when he double bogeyed the first <laughs> and uh, came back with an eagle within like five or six holes. I don't know how how quickly it happened. Uh, so we're back, Denny. We are we're... as last I've checked. We're so back. Listen, it was it was more over than it had ever been, and then and now we're all the way back. So who, it's, uh, it's been good. Who are you most desperate for to win the Masters? Austin Eckro. Uh, I do. I think. Who is this guy? I mean, is he American? Is he over under thirty? Like, he's is he... he's, he's American. Um, he is like your run of the mill golfer who is striking the ball really well right now. And oh, I've got a way, 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 way. I assume worse one. How do you feel about Thorbjorn Olison? I have. I, I ended up with a few of few of him. Yeah, I, I know he he the, uh, the 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 DFS projections really like uh, Thorbjorn. Uh, is is his name? Yeah, no, I I I honestly, I honestly want. I'm a front runner. I want Scotty Scheffler to win. Oh Jesus! I, I gotta be oh, honest. Chalk donkey wants the yeah. best golfer to win. <laughs> <laughs> but I am. Uh, CBS executives won't agree with this. Um, PGA executives might not agree. I, I am sickened that they allow the live people. I know in the, in the majors. Sickening. There has to be some price. That was, the, price. That, that was the one thing that golf could have held over their heads. That's the only thing, you know, they, the they, only thing. they can't win the money war, obviously they, but they, they can say you can't play in any of the meaningful tournaments. And, and uh, but they, they be within minutes. They were like, no, absolutely. You can play in all the good tournaments. Yeah. I, I have resisted multiple live backed uh, buyout offers of this podcast, by the way. Yeah. Well, that was probably a mistake. Br- Bryson was a live guy, right? <laughs> Bryson was he, a live guy. Oh yeah, he's living it up. He, oh well, he, he is. is Bryson was live from the day one. I thought, I thought he was one of the first like <laughs> instant live guys. Yeah. Uh, he is for the. Uh, you guys are both like Simpsons freaks, right? Uh, yes. He is the the perfect. Do you want to know the horrifying truth, or do you want to watch me smack yes. this golf ball yes. three hundred yards? Because he's. Yes. I think he's in first right now. Yes, uh, he is. That he would is. be a and truly horrifying outcome. I'm actually. I'm. I. I'm scared. Uh, for the champions dinner next year, if Bryson DeChambeau wins this year, because you know, for those who don't know, the, the 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 previous year's champion gets to host the dinner where all of the previous Masters champions come and have dinner together, and my my guy is going to serve uh, kale juice and um, you know protein shakes instead of unseasoned boiled chicken and seasoned yeah. broccoli. Yeah, that's exactly it because he is a health nut. And just eyeballs. Um, yeah. just serves liver. nondescript Wall eyeballs. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what these are. I guess they have a lot of protein. Uh, I said that would be a horrifying outcome. 
You know what else would be a horrifying outcome, guys? Uh, Jaden Daniels to the Commanders at number two. <sighs> That's what Kyle has in his latest mock draft. He's overtaken Drake May. A friend of the show, Nate Tice, sold Denny and I on Drake May on Tuesday. Nate, an amazing guest. Check out his work on the Athletic Podcast and over at Yahoo. Uh, but so, Kyle, is there a consensus number two right now, or does your mock speak to the fact that there's not a consensus number two? And why, as of April 11th, are you mocking Jaden Daniels to Washington instead of Drake May? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of is there a consensus what will happen? Yeah, he's been he's been over like he was. I think he got to minus one twenty and minus one forty over a month ago. He's at like minus one sixty five, minus one seventy five, depending on what book you look right now. So yeah, that's not an overwhelming favorite, but he's clearly the favorite to go to. I think every mock, most mocks you'll find that are trying to actually correctly predict the outcome is going to say that he goes to. Is he the consensus second best quarterback in the class? That's an entirely different question. And I don't think so. I don't think he's the second best quarterback from a real life success perspective. Like fantasy is kind of a different story because the dude can run for a thousand yards as a rookie. That's going to be like, that's probably going to be Caleb Williams if he ends up doing that. And he really could do that. So I think from a fantasy perspective, I, I think he's the first quarterback, you know, who should come off boards, especially in redraft dynasty starts to align a little more with the actual NFL yeah. success type of yeah. stuff. But I think I would take, and I hope I, I have to listen to, I got like a, a few minutes into the Nate Tice show and then immediately had to start doing the mock draft. So I couldn't, <laughs> or couldn't listen, but uh, I hope he sold you guys well. Cause I personally would have may as my second quarterback, if I was an NFL team. And I think he is closer to Caleb Williams than Jaden is to him. Well, Kyle, not only did he sell us on Drake may he unsold us on Jaden Daniels, uh, Nate, not a, it's a scary bet for an NFL team to make. It is, I did, it's I fun, to, but yeah, it's I scary. Told on Daniels, I, I was already all the way out, on, so and, I mean, I, and I remain all the way out. So, yeah, Denny, then how do you? I mean, you would, would you take Drake May at number two if you were the Washington Commanders? I mean, the Commanders the, talk about a franchise that just needed the number one pick because, like, it was the one thing they couldn't screw up, they just needed the number one pick. The Commanders yeah. haven't gotten out of their own way for quite literally the entire 21st century. Our guy last year, what's the new owner's name? Josh Harris. Josh yes. Harris. Yeah. Frightening levels of Daniel Snyder energy, at least from like a management perspective, not from like a morality perspective. No, of course. No. But uh, from the way he was managing the team, it seemed like almost as inept. They needed a slam dunk. They didn't get the slam dunk. They got number two. They actually have to make a decision. So you would still, you would take Drake May at number two, I believe. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think Jaden Daniels has so many red flags and I'm, I'm going to try not to get, super hot takey, but I can't imagine this is a hard conversation to have because we're, we're trying to talk about fantasy and reality football, but from a, from a, from a real standpoint, from an NFL draft standpoint, I think that there's too many red flags to draft Jaden Daniels anywhere near the top 10. Like I, I, I don't, I don't think that he should be drafted in that realm, maybe later in the first round or something. Um, from a fantasy standpoint, of course he's going to smash. Like, uh, like, I don't. I actually think it aligns more than people might give it credit. I don't know, man. I, you're I, not good. It, it, it catches no, up no. pretty fast. And if you can't pass, if the guy truly can't pass to the middle of the field. I know, but he. Like, but you're, you're not going to about... have success running. They're just going to like. I mean, we saw this with Anthony Richardson last year, though. The rushing, I mean, health-wise, health and health is especially an issue for Jaden Daniels. The way he plays, I think if you want to make that argument, I'll. I'll Anthony I'll Richardson exceeded out. expectations passing, though. Like Jaden Daniels would have to exceed. I mean, he couldn't throw short of like 10 yards, even yeah, as a rookie. Right. Anthony he struggled Richardson. with that. I think uh, he actually, Anthony Richardson actually perfectly met expectations. If you knew what you were getting with him, he was a good deep ball throw in college. All of his passing numbers were pretty poor, but that's because from like short of 10 yards, he was dreadful. And in the aggregate, that makes you look like a bad passer. But even in college, he was a great deep ball passer. He avoided pressure well and moved out of the pocket, but kept his eyes downfield, hit big plays. And then dude had no freaking touch within 10 yards. That's actually exactly what he was in the NFL for the very brief time we saw him. And he was a really good fantasy option because of it. So I don't think he exceeded expectations as a passer. He just met them. And those are throwing deep as a valuable skill set in the NFL. I, um, yeah, I know. I mean, I, I think, you know, Jaden Daniels strikes me as a kind of fantasy uh, player where, you know, he, we're going to see a dozen rushing attempts in a game. And one of those for is going to be busted, busted off for 50 <laughs> yards and a touchdown. Like, uh, so th I think that that'll be cool. And so this conversation is going to be really fraught, uh, even, you know, when, when he's drafted high, when he starts the season, 
Uh, even if he struggles from a real standpoint, he'll, I think he could still put up a lot of fantasy points. And then, so the conversation will just be any, any, what, anything you want, basically. I don't think Jaden Daniels can follow the Anthony Richardson, like early career, career plan for one thing. Anthony Richardson, well, Anthony Richardson couldn't follow the early career. Well, Anthony Richardson plan true. too, but he was having the, the enormous fantasy success. He was paired with uh, what I will call the Jalen hurts guy, um, Shane Steichen, who knew what he was doing. Uh, Jaden Daniels of ends with Washington is going to be paired with the Kyler Murray guy, Cliff Kingsbury, uh, like a guy who, Really, the only takeaway I ever had from Cliff Kingsbury's offense in Arizona is that he never had a plan B or a backup plan. And if like and the Jane plan A Daniels, was bad. And if Jaden Daniels comes out of the gates struggling as a passer, I have a really, really hard time believing the offense is going to find him layup runs or like the, the scrambling will just be successful. It, the, the scrambling numbers are crazy. I mean, is Jaden Daniels really like that gifted of a runner? I, I know it's absurd to say that over Heisman level thousand year, but He's not big and imposing like Anthony Richardson. He's not blindingly fast the way Lamar Jackson was. He's not like I think he's blind size fast. speed. I package. do think he's actually. I, I think he's that level of speed. Uh, I think, think he's, he's as fast as Lamar Jackson. He's I in that territory. So. I really yeah, don't I, think so. I mean, he I has also play that fast at LSU. He also has some of the best advanced numbers of any guy. He didn't run like quite as much as Lamar in college, but he has honestly his better advanced numbers, like efficiency wise in terms of yards after contact, missed tackles force per attempt than almost any quarterback that we've seen in the past five years. He's, I think in terms of- He volume, was a grown man. He was 24 years old. Like Yeah, Lamar sure. Jackson that absolutely like helps. <laughs> like he was literally like a man amongst boys. Even well, to be fair- half he, a decade. <laughs> he is still I know he weighed in heavier at the combine I don't buy that as playing weight uh but the the he was a grown man stuff he isn't physically built in the way you say a grown man dude Anthony no. Richardson GAM grown a man mm -hmm. uh play, you know combine weight aside I don't really buy that as his playing weight no. Jane Daniels doesn't use that like I'm years older than you. I can physically impose on you. I think he uses speed and agility more so than anything to beat defenders, which I mean it will work a lot in the NFL, but he also it, it lays his body on the line. Yeah. I think he will be much like Anthony Richardson, like elite rusher in the moment he steps onto the field. I do think it'll come in a different way. And that way is, like you said, it's probably not as much design running. I There are very few quarterbacks who have such a hair trigger to scramble than Jaden Daniels coming out Which of college. Which is bad. I think will hurt his rushing, to be honest. If he's so predictable, he can't pass. And they know the first sign of pressure is bailing the pocket. You can't be that predictable in the NFL. And he's just not physically imposing in the way Anthony Richardson is. Not at all. With Cliff Kingsbury, I feel like if he if he like does not if he like underachieves expectations as a passer coming out of the gate, I really don't think you're gonna be able to rely on the running with Jaden Daniels. Where I think the whole offense could be just a complete catastrophe. And by the way, I shouldn't have I guess been truthing the dual threat ability of a guy who just dual threaded his way to the Heisman Trophy. But still, I don't see him as like a Lamar or Anthony Richardson level runner. But that's probably a really bad take, Danny Carter. Well. I mean, the, the difference between a Jaden Daniels and a Lamar Jackson is that Lamar is incredibly creative on, on the run, scrambling, uh, bo both as a runner and a passer. Jaden Daniels is the opposite. Yes. Um, he doesn't do anything. Lamar protects his body, too. Lamar, well, Lamar really a different. huge difference, as you guys are both alluding, alluding to here, is that Lamar Jackson did not have a college highlight reel of getting <laughs> <laughs> like uh or Jaden Daniels, as we know, the one that keeps going on is the highlight reel of him just getting of like uh Michael Irvin and like Mike Ditka yelling jacked up on ESPN right. in 2008. Yeah, no, I mean right. And L Lamar does any anything possible, including sacrificing yards to to avoid big hits. Um, I don't know. You know, Washington fans are, are going to be in shambles if they take Jaden Daniels because they've seen this movie. They need to take Drake May. They They've seen this movie. They know how this ends. It's RG3 all over the again. 24-year-old dual threat with Cliff Kingsbury. It's like, what are we even doing mm -hmm. here, man? Like, seriously, what it's are gonna we doing? It's going to be terrible. Also, I want to address something. The, critic, uh, the criticism of Dan Daniels as a passer is that he, he, he rarely, if ever, threw to the middle of the field. Now, that doesn't mean that he was bad when he threw to the middle of the field. That, those are two different criticisms. He was actually quite good. Was he? I actually didn't know that. So, nope. so the, the Daniels truthers are saying, no, 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 he was good in the middle field. That's not, that's not what it is. No, nobody is saying, nobody is saying that he wasn't good as a moth passer. Uh -huh. It's just that he never did it. And that's, that's a problem.
Same yeah, and here. I think that's kind of the, the Tua thing where if you don't do something really valuable very often, that probably says something about your ability to do it. Tua on the stat sheets is a really good deep ball thrower. It's because he takes the layups that Tyreek Hill and the offensive scheme yeah. affords him, but he's not creating these beautiful deep throws that Josh Allen does where your receiver has six inches of separation and you make the most out of every one of those six inches. He's got a good scheme and he can take the 40 yard layups. And I think that's probably some of what's going on with Jaden Daniels. He had two great receivers in a good college scheme. They gave him layups that he drilled, but he wasn't forcing throws successfully to the middle of the field. So Kyle, going back to Tuesday, listeners of this podcast have heard almost uninterrupted and almost without exaggeration, 20 straight minutes of Jaden Daniels slander. Uh, like what is the positive case for Jaden Daniels other than He's an electrifying athlete. He did just win the Heisman Trophy. Um, there's yeah, there are reasons he's a top there. five prospect. I'm just saying there's reasons <laughs> he's a top five prospect. What what is like? What, how is Jaden Daniels still like basically a slam dunk top four or five pick despite all the very very obvious red flags? Yeah, I mean in totality he's an elite passer. Like like Denny said, he doesn't throw to the middle of the field very often at all, and that's a, a skill we want our quarterbacks to have. But he's a great deep thrower. He was the most efficient college quarterback last year, and he was in college for a long time. He transferred from Arizona State, but early in his career he actually had one successful season at Arizona State, where you can look at that and say like he had a long and winding career path. But it's not like he came out of nowhere. He you know in terms of the Heisman caliber of season he had, that kind of came out of nowhere. But he found limited but meaningful success early in his career and i do think the age thing is something the nfl is less and less concerned about by the year we saw it with someone like joe burrow at the age he came out at that yeah it, it helps to be successful earlier in, in your career and translate that to nfl stardom right away but it's not it's not the death knell so i think that is probably to some degree overblown and the nfl seems to acknowledge that because they seem poised to take him second overall Love to do nothing for half a decade at Arizona State and then become... No, no, he did something player. one year and then nothing other years. And <laughs> with LSU. I absolutely love it. By the way, you have horrible news from producer Adam that Austin Eckler is back to even par. <laughs> the Masters. <laughs> Austin Eckler. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he's back He's back to par. Uh, you guys yeah, know. he uh, hit one in the water per my sources, which is my... My buddy texting me saying, Eckrod's dead again. No, and per your sources of the golf, oh, it's not on the golf channel. Like ESPN being on in the background of your office while you podcast. Oh, no. Uh, there's no TV in here. No. Kyle Dvorak, uh, the first four picks, not to spoil your mock, are Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and then, of course, Mr. J.J. McCarthy at number four. You have it with a trade-up uh, with the Arizona Cardinals, uh, which is all gets very confusing. Oh, yeah, the Cardinals do have four. I was like, how do the Cardinals have four in your mock? It's because they They're have bad. Four. It's because they have <laughs> four in their life. <laughs> How are it, is it safe to say we might not know the order, but it's almost impossible to leave the first four picks are not quarterbacks at this point? It could be the first four of the first five are quarterbacks. I do think, though, we're getting, and I'll, we'll mention this later, we're getting some steam. We've had it for a while that the Giants are interested in a quarterback. I just don't think they're willing to move off of their spot at six to take likely the fourth best quarterback if, you know, it's assumed that's J.J. McCarthy makes it to them. Maybe he does and they take him. I don't even know if. He makes it to them and they do take it, but there's some steam there. There's obvious steam that like the Broncos, I mean, what are they doing at quarterback? They just probably don't have the firepower necessarily to move up to four, but it's a threat. And then the Raiders are probably more willing to move up to get a quarterback. They also have a big need at quarterback. All of this coming out makes me say that I think, you know, imagine being a uh, quasi Mensa, the Vikings GM, and you move up to five and you don't move up to four. And then someone leaps you for your quarterback. Yeah. How do you go back to ownership and say like, yeah, we moved up to five. I want to take a receiver to pair with Sam Darnold. I think assuming there is even some air of legitimacy to the, the smoke, you know, that is probably underlying the fire of there are a lot of teams that want the fourth quarterback. I think it's JJ McCarthy. I think they have to move up to four. Do they move up to five and then just flip with the Cardinals, basically give the Cardinals a, you know, fourth round pick to, as insurance, essentially say, hey, we got to make sure no one jumps us. You still get Marv. That's also possible. I had that in my first mock, actually. I had the Cardinals staying there. So I think it could be at five. I think it most likely Quezzy has to move up all the way to four to ensure that he gets ultimately J.J. McCarthy. It is weird. Like, I, it does sort of seem like the Cardinals. It's almost been like the Steelers and Najee Harris. I, <laughs> I know some people are saying Malik Neighbors could still be the first receiver off the board, but the Cardinals have seemed really, really committed to taking Marvin Harrison. And I could see them just not wanting to rock the boat and just like, no matter what, like it's number four, no matter, because it gets very, very complex. 
It gets extra complex because the number five that the team picking was literally J.J. McCarthy's college coach. There's, I just feel like there's so many weird things going on. Well, I, my opinion is the Vikings are moving up to five or four before the draft, no matter what, because I, like, like Quezzy is a, I believe Princeton grad, Stanford, uh, Stanford. Yeah, as a matter of fact, half the baseball GMs are Ivy League grads who are absolutely horrific general managers. <laughs> That's true, no but difference. he, yeah, he has seemed like a very analytics heavy guy. The move to pick up the twenty third overall pick in like I think it was March when it happened makes absolutely no sense because they lost value and who is sitting here in March saying like, I don't know what's going to happen in the chaos of the draft, but I sure as hell know the 23rd picks a good one. Like that's a very facially obvious move that someone else has told them we want another first round pick. If you're going to move up, I don't think they just like grab that 23rd pick then sit at, I believe 11 overall is theirs. So they're moving up to five or four. And I still think, you know, even if they move up to five, they probably they, obviously they're doing it with the Chargers. They probably end up just flipping uh, the Cardinals for a cheap pick to ensure they get their guy. And the Cardinals in that scenario still get Marv without any risk too, because it's all quarterbacks ahead of them. I'd be excited if McCarthy ends up in Minnesota uh, from a fantasy standpoint. I I think it, it, that just fits really well. Like he he doesn't give up big negative plays. He keeps you know keeps an offense on time. You know nothing spectacular. But I mean, he can, I think he can run Kevin O'Connell's offense and Kevin O'Connell is the kind of coach that just wants a guy, a guy behind center who's going to do exactly what he's told. Um, and, and so they're going to replace Kirk Cousins with Kirk Cousins. I, think. I want to believe that I still, oh man, I think it's a little too convenient to blame all of JJ McCarthy's like lack of explosive plays based on Jim Harbaugh. Like we like so convinced ourselves, it's just how Harbaugh plays. This is how he does it. This is nothing you can do about it. It doesn't matter. You can have Joe Montana. It wouldn't matter. Like, I, I, are we entirely sure that the reason, like, yeah, I know, like, the stats weren't amazing or whatever. I know the film, like, is fine but not amazing. But it's just the nature of the offense. Like, if you're Wait, a top five quarterback, right. usually you outshine that kind of thing. I don't know. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think it can be as simple as saying, like, Jim Harbaugh was not interested in passing the ball. Um, and and th that offense, that Michigan offense did a lot of run, run, pass, right? Which is not what we like, but it is what worked because they had a dominant run, run game for most of that time and, uh, and a, a dominant defense. So, yeah, I mean, they got away with it. But, uh, you know, McCarthy, per our colleague Zach Kruger, uh, did really well, was very efficient in third and long or third and short situations where he was forced to make a play and he often did. And it was, I think that's a sign that he could have been in another system. I think he, he could have been way, way more productive to the point of us saying, should he be like a number one, number two guy to play back to back years of big time college football and not reach 3000 yards passing. I, I, I just, I know when you're not, when you're not even like a, a yeah. real deal dual threat, like he ran, but man, I. What do you think I, the most points Michigan gave up last year was? I had to look this up. I don't know. It was. No it was they gave up like twenty-five one game. They, Twenty-four twice, and they they started their season. Hold on, the, the Big Ten. I mean, just every. No, I think there's one Iowa. There's ten Iowas. No, agreed. But like the reason that you don't have to ever throw the football is because in the Big Ten, scoring nine points. That's all. You know, throws the football win. in the Big Ten. Urban Meyer sure did it. Ryan Day sure did. I mean, Ryan Day did it till it drove him insane, and now he's going to stop throwing the football. Yeah, and look where that got him. We lost. We lost to Michigan and to Mizzou. There, there was well, that, all right, we, that one doesn't count. It was our JV team. Congrats. <laughs> Dang. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt here, but uh, uh, go back. I, if, if I can uh, just kind of reiterate how little passing went on last year for the Wolverines. So they had a stretch here in the middle of the season uh, against Rutgers. JJ McCarthy threw 20 passes. Against Nebraska, he threw 16. Against Minnesota, he threw 20. Against Indiana, he threw 16. So, like, that that's wild. That's wild stuff, you know? I, how How is anybody supposed to do anything with, with that sort of opportunity? If you're that good, though, you just do it. Or, like, oh, they just call the offense that way. Even, like, A.J. McCarron, like, the dark day, <laughs> the darkest days of the Alabama dynasty, they were throwing yeah. more than this. Like, I just I, – I, I tend – I actually do, I think, agree with your point. But I do just question if we can really believe. I mean, dude, this is in 15 games. This isn't like 12 or 13 games. He was not reaching 3,000 yards. And 
I, but I just told, I'm I sure just it's by mostly the system, but I, I don't know. I just I'm, I'm also in your position, Pat, where like I generally kind of I get I get the sentiment of your point. Like, dude, if you're that good, your team would really be willing to throw like throw more often. At the same time, um, I don't blame them for doing the thing that works because they lost one game out of 29, I believe, I in the past in two conference. years. Let's go play in a real conference. Then. I know, I know. <laughs> like, face one good offense, and, and you'll have to throw. A Michigan bit. could but, never beat Alabama. It, uh, that, that was a joke because they, they did beat Alabama like four months ago. Was the joke? Yeah, I know. I'm stuck in the position where I kind of have to support Michigan because they beat us, and them being better makes us look better. You know, uh, transitive property type of stuff. But like the way we say with the Chiefs, like, oh, these morons can't keep going with jabroni receivers, and they and then they keep getting away with it. So you know, they kind of can keep doing that. The same in part is true with McCarthy in that I don't blame the team for not for not throwing a lot when the same team. When I think it's twenty eight and one or whatever in his tenure, maybe slightly less than that. It worked finally. It didn't work for like five years. The Michigan approach kept getting exposed every single year in the most important games, and then it did finally work last year. I just, I, I think JJ McCarthy. I think it's being totally. The narrative is always we get there's too much time for the draft, so I feel like narratives tend to do a complete one eighty. I, I think that like Jaden Daniels, including by me, is being sold. Is like a more like of a franchise killing type pick than JJ McCarthy. They could both be really good. I think the backbreaking potential is still much higher with JJ McCarthy than Jaden Daniels. Like, to, you played 29 games in Michigan over the past two years and didn't get to 6,000 yards passing on a team that lost like one or two games. Like almost unfathomable to me. Like truly. Yeah, no, I get it. I, I'm sympathetic to this argument for sure. He was a, look, I mean, you're talking about a, a, a four star recruit coming out. He was a five star recruit. I, I see four here, but okay, yeah, whatever. It doesn't well, matter. Hey, you know, th thanks for bolstering my argument. Then five, eight, eight star <laughs> recruit, an eight star, and you, and you're saying he can't be good. I, I'm saying that usually the talent at some point overtakes the system. All right, okay, okay, real quick, I, I got to get this off my, my get him, Denny, get him. This isn't about no Pat. roast him. Do it, roast him. <laughs> no, crush him. Talk about his family. Do it. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about the Cardinals sweater. I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, come on. Man. <laughs> um anyway listen th this nfl uh, treasures guys who don't make mistakes like they like that's all all he wasn't is. even given the chance to make mistakes he could be terrible it's all well what i'm saying is in a league where everything is checked down everything is safe all it's it's just all about replacing the run game with short passing to guys who are fast. Okay, that's why I think Malik Neighbors is like the perfect fit for the modern current NFL because he'll just catch a bunch of short passes and then run to the end zone like Jamar Chase, right? So I, I think he fits in, in a way today that he maybe wouldn't have ten years ago. So you have McCarthy, you have Bo Nix, you have Michael Penix. All these guys I think fit better today than they would have ten years ago. Uh, and I think we have to adjust our mindset to that. Mm, I don't, I don't know, know if we do. Uh, this, is, this is my 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 thought. I and a guy and a guy, an extraordinary athlete like Jaden Daniels, maybe doesn't it doesn't mean as much because of because of that dynamic. Because defenses are so good and they they adjust so quickly to these things and they snuff out everyone, including Patrick Mahomes. Pat, I like your rebuttal of. Eh, I don't know. <laughs> it, it even it doesn't matter really what the current style in the NFL is almost without fail, if you're going in the top five as a quarterback, you had explosive college highlights and statistics. And it's this very – it would be a humongous outlier for J.J. McCarthy to suddenly be like a 4,000-yard passer in the NFL. I mean, he was really efficient in college football. Like, I mean, like it's another thing we talked about. Yeah, it's very the, easy to be efficient when I you're know. playing Indiana and Maryland. And, I was a good defense. Yeah, Buckeyes are a great defense, baby. Go Bucks. Yeah, I've asked for like 160 yards against some real good stuff. Against uh, which one? <laughs> against Ohio State. Uh, well, go Bucks even more. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just see about J.J. The J.J. McCarthy rehabilitation tour has been quite, quite interesting to me. Um, but we'll be right back after this. Get your weekdays started with Bet the Edge. Join Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick as they break down the NFL draft, NBA, and much more. New episodes drop at 6 a.m. Eastern on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And you can find them in podcast form wherever you download and, and subscribe. So whether you're looking to get involved in draft props or futures wagers, check out Jay and Drew for more insight. And don't forget, 
find all your favorite NBC sports shows and Amazon music. Just head to amazon.com slash NBC sports. I also don't think Kevin O'Connell is like a, a Jim Harbaugh type. Of, Kevin O'Connell is really, I don't even really know if he's an efficiency passer kind of guy. He's just a passing kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I don't really know if JJ McCarthy is a, like, so yeah, the guy who was never allowed to pass is now mm -hmm. here and he's the passer. I don't right. like that I'm being co-opted into the, the JJ McCarthy argument of this side because like I'm generally not that pro JJ McCarthy. Like if I am a NFL franchise, I'm not trading first round picks to move up to get him. I'm happy if he lands to me in that like Mac Jones mold of I don't know if you can exceed your limitations, but quarterback matters. You were successful, you were efficient. I'm willing to find out when I sit at pick 11, 12, 13. Mortgage your future. Who don't know about that, buddy? I'm talking about mortgaging your future, Kyle. You have the Raiders trading up for Bo Nix at number nine. I is like this, that. Is this something? So is Bo, Bo Nix is a first rounder now, just like set and forget first rounder. When did I miss this? I don't know about set and forget first rounder, but we've gotten a lot of steam. And we see this every year, so it's difficult to say how much of it is accurate, how much of it is smoke. But uh, we've gotten a lot of steam that we're looking much more like uh, five to six quarterbacks going in the first round with the other two being Knicks and Penix. I personally prefer uh, Knicks a meaningful amount to Penix, and I don't have Penix as a first round pick in this mock draft. That'll be out absolutely time cannot this. wait to take two 25 year olds who played at four different schools between them. But there's, I mean, we have a, a report as of, I think it was yesterday from ESPN's Paul Gutierrez saying that both uh, Tom Telesco, new GM of the Raiders and Antonio Pierce, interim to now full-time head coach, have been given the the blessing by Raiders owner Mark Davis to make a move, any move, those are the exact words, within reason. Uh, yeah, that approach has always worked for Mark Davis in the past. I know. Oh, but I mean, I, I do think they have a little bit more willingness and firepower to be I don't know, aggressive, but moving around for quarterback that the Broncos don't have. And I do think Knicks would be the preferred option of both of those teams over Penix. Danny, where are you at Bo Nix right now? Yeah, 100 bubble screens for Devontae Adams if Bo Nix goes to Vegas. That's that's the prognosis. I'm I'm not down on Bo Nix. I know, I know he's 100, but I mean. <laughs> I absolutely love quarterbacks. Michael Penix, Bo Nix. Jaden Daniels, where I can go back to their sports reference, and they have seasons that were before the pandemic. Just absolutely love it. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no pushback against that. I don't there, there's nothing <laughs> to say <laughs> about about that. Uh, I, don't I don't know, man. I, I, I mean, I feel like Bo Nix would be a really good fit in Denver because all Sean Payton wants to do is throw screens and. You know, um, Nix is the screen master. I just, ha I feel like like the thing I talked about before. In a checkdown league, there's got to be room for a checkdown dude, and that's Bo Nix. The thing is, you don't come into the league as a checkdown guy. <laughs> that that really, I think, is a huge like. You can't. You have to come into the someone in the league as someone who like uh, goes beyond. Like maybe you'll get turned into that in the NFL. But if you're coming into the league and you're already being projected, like, he's just gonna be a checkdown guy. Uh, it seems like a really great ten-year franchise plan. Uh, draft to be checkdown quarterback. I just think they could be a catastrophic mistake. I Work feel like for Tom Brady. <laughs> Tom Brady was not a check down guy. I hate to admit and hate to give him props on that. But um, he, he was the whole package. He was special. Um, if you're coming in and they're already billing you as a check down guy, I mean, I, I don't know, man. Seems like I'm not, yeah, right. I'm not saying a guy like Bo Nix has like an amazing ceiling for, for uh, pro purposes, uh, fantasy purposes, certainly, but. Uh, I, I just think he fits like the, like teams are dying for viable quarterbacks right now. And, and Denny, to your point, he's a guy who does really well under pressure. Unlike Penix, who does great at not taking sacks under pressure, he doesn't do a ton after not taking the sack. Yeah. He's not making these great plays. Unlike third down, he doesn't get sacked on third down, but he's not always converting the third down, which is like functionally also kind of a sack. You lose the drive anyways, which is, you know, it's good to not take sacks but it's better to not take the sack and then do something. That's kind of the, the two-sided coin that makes Mahomes so special is, of course, he doesn't take sacks. He's also a baller when he's scrambling and not taking the sack. Nix was really good at both of those aspects uh, while playing on the West Coast against non-real teams, but, you know, in his sixth college season at the age of 29. But. So you're saying Nick's uh, closest comp is Mahomes. That's no, 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 no. To be clear, <laughs> I think that's what I'm we're not hearing. saying that. Not saying that at all. All right.
love to absolutely have a senior year at Oregon and then return for another senior year. <laughs> Dude, come on. I mean, like, I, I know it may have been the Oh, system. so he's studious and you don't like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is it crime to go to school now? I thought you were pro education. <laughs> I just don't know. I don't, I don't know. But I, I would argue if you're coming into the league as a check down guy, you don't even have a floor. Like you can't be the check down guy. You got to be more. You got to f- find some something more to the player. Then there could be more to Bonex. Penix has that. Just I know we're jumping around here, but like Penix is not just the check down guy. Like he he has a he has a rifle of an arm. I, I yeah. His Nick Nick doesn't have a bad arm either. I don't think entirely. He has a ton of check downs, a ton of screens that really juiced his his counting stats. But like. I don't blame his team for finding something that was successful sort of in the same way we talk about McCarthy, the, the lack of doing something, especially when you translate it to college, to NFL, the lack of doing something or the overemphasis on something is a red flag. It, 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 you know, it puts me on alert to maybe they were using him on a ton of screens because they didn't trust his arm. They didn't trust his reads, but I don't think it necessarily means he can't do that. That can just be a product of the, of the system that he was in. Well, now okay. is it is like a different question. And this, I think I just hit at basically what I find to be the fundamental problem with both Knicks and McCarthy, where I, I'm just not used to franchise quarterback, first round quarterbacks coming into the league as system quarterbacks. Because when you're a legitimate blue chip quarterback prospect, the system is you in yeah. college. Like you are the system. Like your your talent transcends and they they build the offense around you. I know the league is changing, but coming into the league as a system quarterback, that's that's a new one. It I is. mean, that's kind of why Caleb's so special is because yeah. in college, I mean, the thing is, they also didn't win as many games as McCarthy did in college. But for various reasons, uh, you know, the, the staff there was like, I don't know, Caleb, line sucks, defense sucks, you figure it out. In terms of like what he put on tape and his counting stats, he absolutely figured it out. What are you say, Denny Carter? I, 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 I'm with you. I mean, I, I do I do get that a game manager is a tough sell as a first round pick uh, at at quarterback. But I I, I think that there are enough coaches out there, you know, uh, the, the, the Shanahan tree and, you know, other coaching trees, the McVay tree that are okay with just having a game manager who is going to make the throws that need to be made against defenses that no longer allow anything deep. You can, I think even in today's NFL, though, you can still find those guys not in the first round. Right. That's, that's truly all you're looking for. I don't well, think you don't okay. to do that. And, right, Pat. And and that's why I think that people were talking about uh, Bo Nix and Michael Penix uh, 30 days ago. We were talking about them as a day two pick, right? And so that that made sense to me. I, I, I'm not entirely sure that I'm, I'm comfortable like with taking them in the top 20 or something, but but I think that I think that you're going to have to because of the quarterback thirst in the league. I think you're going to have to. Some years the thirst is not there. It, the teams are thirsty, thirsty. Oh, very, very <laughs> thirsty. Kyle, we alluded to this earlier, but you still have Marvin Harrison Jr. as the first receiver off the board over Malik Neighbors. How confident are you in that? And is, is, is Marvin Harrison is he is he Najee Harris to the Steelers when it comes to the Cardinals? Uh, no, I don't think when he, when it comes to the Cardinals specifically, if the Cardinals remain in the top five, yes, it is absolutely like, even if we don't have sort of that general smoke of like, we know the team likes him. He's, I think he's, to me, he's like the best player in this draft. We just have to care a lot about positional value. I think he's the most complete player. Like you said, I, I think he's, I think he's a better prospect than Chase. Mark Cooper is kind of the last player who I think comes, you know, in that range to him. And uh, I mean, that's a special tier of player. If he's there when you are picking and you don't need a quarterback, you pick him. It's just a matter of do the Cardinals get a King's ransom, potentially like three first round picks or something to move with the uh, Vikings. And the Chargers are going to face that dilemma as well. But to me, there's and neighbors is great. I think neighbors would have been the top receiver last year and in plenty of other years. I mean, honestly, Dunze probably would have been the top receiver last year as well. He almost certainly would have. This isn't last year. This is a great class. And Harrison to me is pretty much a stone cold lock to be the first receiver. I neighbors is good. I, I think Harrison is better. And I think most teams believe Harrison is better more specifically. I do agree with you. I think it's mostly just betting boredom that people are like kind of, or mock draft boredom that neighbors yes. is going ahead of by the way, Marvin Content Harrison, famine. Marvin Harrison jr. So good and has such dog levels. Why was he afraid to play against Mizzou? 
That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't you be? Yeah, I would be. <laughs> Good point. I would be oh so scared to have any more involvement with Mizzou than I already do, since all they do is absolutely ruin my life. And, uh, hey, they we were good last year, weren't they? They were good. They were good. Uh, this show has been good. But we will be right back after this. This Saturday, the Premier League continues on NBC when Bruno Fernage and Manchester United look to keep pace in the top half of the table when they face Bournemouth. The match begins at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. I'm trying to think of any final thoughts on Neighbors. And so, Denny, you like Neighbors? I like, I mean, it's, yeah. How do, uh, I just think Neighbors fits the modern game really well. Uh, um, as a, 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 you know, blazing fast guy who is good after the catch. Like, it, I, I'm, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm too dismissive of like bigger, more traditional receivers who um, work on the boundary. Um, Who actually play wide receiver? Yeah, yeah, like that. That feels over. That feel that era uh, feels over to me. Denny, whenever whenever Pat says like, "Oh, the run game's back," you and I both generally go like, "I don't think this is cyclical." I actually think the NFL is moving away from it. But whenever you say the NFL is moving away from the big boundary guy, I join Pat's side and go, "Nah, it's cyclical, baby." MHJ, <laughs> let's get it. Yeah, no, I, I, it could be, it could be, I, but I'm, it's, it's why like. I feel like like T Higgins in another era of the NFL would have been like crazy dominant, like yeah. like maybe like the best player in football type guy. And now it's like what is it like what does he do? He's well, like, I, I do think it is like I think the returns have begun to diminish on like the five ten receivers and like Jamar Chase is about as small as you can go. Not that he's small. Um well he's thick. I mean he's he's yeah. not tall, but he's he's thick and and that's that that gets lost in the size talk as well and size obviously size does matter with these prospects and and you say well well this guy's tall but you know he's really skinny if, if, whether we're talking about a receiver or quarterback um neighbors does not i mean unless i'm missing something does not profile as a as a particularly small guy right i sort of think no i sort of think last year too might have been the peak of like the small receiver and that teams even if they want to take that approach like smaller yak guys who do stuff over the middle of the field like the the outside boundary threat is still like absolutely essential if for no other reason to occupy the attention of the safeties. And I, I think the people, I think it's going to come kind of more into equilibrium. I don't know, prospect. man. I don't I, know. I think that's lost in this with Marvin Harrison's like when we talk about, I think like Mike Williams and T Higgins types is that they don't need separation to win and they're not the best separators. Marvin Harrison, he's probably not quite like the pure RAS level athlete that like Malik Neighbors or Brian Thomas are. But like, I'd take the over on like nine RAS, 90th percentile. I would take the over. He generates separation at will because he's an extreme athlete. I don't think he's a 99th percentile athlete, but I do think he's a 90th percentile athlete who has extremely good routes. Like, he's not going to only go outside and win jump balls. He's also going to go outside. He mostly is going to play outside. He was really efficient in the slot. Didn't play a lot in the slot but he's going to go outside and get separation. He's going to be open on the outside and beat his cornerback, not at the catch point, which he can also do, but he's also going to beat them by creating separation. So I do kind of agree. Like, I don't think you should, I think it was more easy to build the entire plane out of jump balls, probably in the nineties than it is now. But Marvin Harrison isn't only getting jump balls. I mean, yeah, and not even, you don't have to even go back to the nineties. And I, I, obviously you could go back to like 2010, like AJ green type Julio Jones type uh, um, guys. Uh, I don't know if, if they if they fit as well because of the way defenses ha have adjusted. And we talk about how the like the analytics revolution, whatever that might be, has changed other sports. Like in basketball, it means everybody shoots threes or layups and nothing else, right? In baseball, I don't know what does it mean. That what does it mean? Uh, it means launch angle. You try okay. to hit home runs, and when you're pitching, you try to get strikeouts. Right. At the expense of everything else, and you throw as hard as possible, even if it means. Your uh, UCL uh, detonates. Yeah, exactly. And that's why every pitcher is now injured, right? And uh, uh, so in, in football, I think it means you get like like solid, accurate, smart quarterbacks who can deliver short and intermediate passes on time. Uh, and you get receivers who can do a lot with the ball after that. And you go from there. That's just what I've observed over the past five years or so. It's true, but um, much more so than baseball. Uh, defense, like there's actually a defense that can adjust in the NFL 
which I think will keep things more cyclical. The NBA, in theory, the defenses can't adjust, but there's only so much you can do to adjust to six foot eleven freak athletes who shoot forty percent from three. <laughs> so I think that's why the NBA is having a bit harder time adjusting. The NFL, though, like it's there's no doubt that's the most efficient, analytically sound way to play. It's also though the defense can actually counter punch. The NBA, I just don't know how you counter punch, and in baseball, you literally can't counter punch. It's a batter versus pitcher matchup, and so you basically have to wait for the league to change the rules, which they've been doing. Right. Um, so we'll see. The NFL, though, I, large receiver does large <laughs> things. I mean, I just have a hard time believing that'll actually go. Extinct. I think. I think part of it too is like with Marvin Harrison, and I think this was probably true, especially with like Julio and Calvin Johnson. They are sort of that like Wemby level, like oh, you can move as fast as almost anyone. Yeah, I think yeah. in a straight line, neighbors can probably just pure burn. And so could Tom, Brian Thomas, pure burn Marvin. But like, they are just different breeds of athlete. You know, I mean, that's that was something that was so special about Calvin and Julio's. They were also could generate separation. And I do think that's maybe where Marvin Harrison can break the mold of the NFL being so focused on yak and just get the guy, don't make a mistake, get the guy the football and let him run. Like, he can do a lot of that too. He can be sort of the 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 mold breaker in terms of the way the NFL is going because he can do what the NFL right. likes, but what used to also make it different. I didn't. I, I thought Marvin Harrison was kind of lacking after the catch. Is that wrong? He's fine after the catch. He's not like incredible right. after the catch, but I do think he's a good. He's a better separator than some of the guys we've talked about. Denny, has Chet Holgram ever considered being a real center once? Um, maybe just be a real center. I don't know. You're seven foot one. Uh, That's he got. He plays for the Thunder. He does. Gotta believe it. Never yeah. thought about being a real center just one time instead of a shooting five threes a game. When I got back into basketball, if that's what you want to call it, back in during the uh, during the pandemic, I I was freaked out. Absolutely, it just, is freaky. Almost like falling off my couch every time I watched, and I would see a center, a seven foot two center, bring the ball up the court. Yeah, and I was like, why is that guy? Why is that guy dribbling? Mm -hmm. And why isn't a little guy just running up behind him and easily stealing it? Yeah, you know? I mean, what what is what is this? I know. I know. It's, Every it's, everybody grew up to be a point guard. What have they done in the game we love? Um, <laughs> final final draft topic. We get to we'll, we will get to Kyle. You have Brock Bowers outside of the top ten. He was a player we talked about a lot on Tuesday with Nate Tice. How confident are you that Brock uh, love absolutely love tight ends that don't have positions? Uh, how confident are you that he'll fall outside the top ten? Uh, not supremely confident, though. I think the days of people mocking him to like the Chargers at five appear to be over. I think they're more likely to either, if they stay there, go receiver or tackle or trade out well back. Uh, I, I, I still think 12 or so, 12 or 13 is his absolute floor. If he falls out of the top 10 in air quotes, it's because he just barely fell out. And it's because positional value wise, like when he's drafted, He's going to be closer to being paid as one of the top players at his position than quarterback, than wide receiver, than like tackle, than, than the premier positions. Obviously, that's part of why they go so high is because you get a salary cap advantage that you don't get as much of with Brock. I do think, like, look, we give him a lot of the, he, he doesn't have a position. That's awesome. You know, we give him that guff a little bit, but like he can truly win in the way a lot of NFL tight ends win. He just also has this added layer where he can be, an elite, you know, pass catching, you know, slot type of receiver, a, a screen player. But even when you just look at his stuff, 10 plus yards downfield, he's one of the best tight end prospects of the past 10 years. He just gets to pad the number, quote, pad the numbers. This is still valuable with like somewhat gimmicky yak stuff with yak stuff that you may not see as much of in the NFL. It's really, really good stuff from Kyle and his mock draft. Check it out. It will be live on rotorworld.com when you are listening to this podcast. And um, how many mocks? Are you going to do one more before the draft, two more? I'll do at least one more, and maybe we'll do two more. We'll see. We will see. We're going to have so much good draft content on NFL.com between the likes of K Kyle, Eric Froton, Zach Kruger. Just a lot, a lot of really good stuff coming. We have some really good redraft stuff right now from Mr. Denny Carter. We've talked a lot about the Texans offense on the show. Kyle had an article right when the trade went down, but Denny got to take a bit of a little longer look at it, dive into the numbers more on the Texans offense, and – so, for you really think you think BFF Bobby is ready to go pass heavy, open this thing up, Denny? Is that what you found? Yeah, I mean, I I, I hinted at this uh, on a recent show where I think that you know acquiring Diggs and and, and uh, to to pair with Tank Dell and Nico Collins is enough to tell us that like yes, we are committed 
to just doing the thing. You know, like we're just we're just going to let CJ Stroud drop back and propel us to, uh, you know, to to I don't know AFC South Championship glory, glory, <laughs> glory. Okay, I'm I'm trying to pump the brakes a little bit, but I mean they they're, they're a really good team, really good offense. Uh, even without you know before they got Diggs, um, and e- even though this is like late career, not as productive Diggs, I, th- I still think it was a, a good acquisition. So uh, we they had one game. The Texans had one game last year that really stood out as like like a moment of of like you said glory for the C.J. Stroud led offense, where they played the um, they played the Bucks in Week Nine. It was thirty nine to thirty seven win against Tampa, and Bobby Slowick just let Stroud cook. Okay. They were 10% over their uh, first down pass rate over expected, um, 8, 8% over for the game uh, overall, um, and really, really aggressive. They they got away from the run-run pass thing that they had been doing uh, early in that season. After they kind of got freaked out, they went pass heavy to start the season. I think I think the media reaction was like, what are you doing? You have a, you have a rookie. You have to run the ball. You have to give it to uh, – who was the running back? Uh Damian, Damian Pierce before Damian he Pierce. got shadow realm. He's, he's no longer in the league, but uh, the NFL's worst running back. You have to give it to him. Uh, and and that so Bobby Slow kind of you know got balanced or run heavy, but against the Bucks they let it rip and it really worked out. Four hundred and seventy something yards for Stroud, five touchdowns. I'm not saying that that's going to be a standard, obviously, okay. But I, I think it showed what can happen when Stroud is s- sort of you know g- is given some slack on on what he can do here. Um, Another example that jumps out at what not to do is when they played against the uh, the Panthers and they lost somehow to the Panthers, a game I heard about a lot from Carolina fans. Uh, they uh, Bobby Slovak was 10% under his expected dropback rate. Um, they were hyper conservative on third downs. Like that has to go. That that all has to go. I would also, I pointed out in the article that the, the, the Texans, D'Amico Ryans was ultra conservative on fourth downs. I think that they need to re-examine that with with Stroud and with the, that trio of receivers. But I do think that they're they're set up to go super pass heavy. I I, I will say that because Stroud doesn't have any or or not much at least rushing upside, I don't think that that means that he's like you know that that he should be like drafted among like the Josh Allen's and Jalen Hurts's of the world. But I I do think that you know he could lead the league in passing yards, something like that. I just think that uh, you know, we're, all, we're all hoping, we're projecting, like, surely they have to pass more. But you make mm-hmm. the point in the article. Like, it really – it's a telltale sign, kind of like when the Bills went out and got Stefan Diggs. When you go out and get a receiver, uh, when you specifically go out and get Stefan Diggs, it means you're ready to pass. You're you're ready. You understand the nature of your offense. Yes. Like, so they just didn't understand the nature. They Even in that Colts game, I think, in week 18 that they had to win, they were going, like, hyper-conservative modes. Like, dude, just – you're, you got to live or die with yeah. CJ Stroud. Like, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, they, exactly. Yes. And, and I think by the end of the season, they did, they did embrace that idea of living or dying with Stroud. I honestly think that they were, they were kind of taken aback by their early success and like, Oh wait, what, what, are, what, what are we doing now? We're winning. We're competing every <laughs> week uh, because we have this great quarterback that we got second overall. Um, but I just think that there are tweaks that need to be made. And I, and I have confidence in Ryan's and in Sloic that they will make that. They seem like sharp guys. Uh, actually Kyle mentioned this. I looked into it very strongly. Uh, their, uh, use of, uh, 11 personnel, which means one running back, one tight end and three receivers, um, was among the lowest uh, in the league last year. Um, also they used, uh, 21 personnel, two running backs, one tight end and two receivers at a very high rate, at the, the highest rate in the league, actually. So I, I I think that that's that's something that needs to be looked at and tweaked because you got to get all three of these guys on the field. I don't really know who comes off in two receiver sets, but hopefully, it's I mean, really, <laughs> it's the it's the five it's, five eight yeah. hundred and six. But but it, it should, I, I don't think it should over. be ideally it shouldn't be an issue because they're they're they should be up there with like the rams as far as they sh- 11 personnel. they 100 percent should be up there with the rams like a 90 percent. you are only playing big yeah. personnel when it's second and one when it's first and goal like first and goal to two like you can throw those in there maybe yeah. make some extra like double tight end for play action stuff yeah but when you are not trying to sell something that you're not gonna do put all three receivers out there don't right. mess around and and um i, I so i think that 
if you're if you're t- taking what they did last year and saying okay they're going to do this this year i think that's a, that's a mistake and projecting this offense i'm not sure if anybody's going to do that but i was just the article was just basically like we we cannot copy and paste 2023 into 2024 for houston yeah, real quick to end the show see who was going to score more fantasy points in 2024 cj stroud or patrick mahomes denny i know your answer but what's the answer uh, I mean, unless unless Mahomes. So you think Mahomes receiver. finished? So <laughs> no, 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 no. no unless, unless, I mean, if Mahomes gets a receiver in the draft who who can you know sort of help remake the offense, I think it's Mahomes. But if they don't do anything with the receivers, then I would say Stroud. Well, what do you think, Kyle? That's a sickening. I, we were talking to uh, I was talking to Pat Crane a few weeks ago. And as much as it is like everything points to Mahomes not being the fantasy god we're used to, like the low A dot, the great defense, the fact that it worked, so it seems like something they're willing to repeat. It we also we we also did do this uh two, I believe, years ago, in which Mahomes had a down season. I guess it was three now. Mahomes had a down season like three years ago, and we go up. Oh, Leagues figured it out. Mahomes, you know, they can be successful, but he's not the guy anymore. And then he had a like career year right after that. Betting against Mahomes, whether from a real life or a fantasy perspective, feels very bad. And as they were underdogs in a bunch of games last year, you know, down the stretch right there, underdog in the Super Bowl, I believe to the Ravens as well. It just felt like, I don't know, man, pick Mahomes and you're generally right. And and they're giving me a little bit of, you know, they give me a little bit of the spread, give me a little bit of juice to do it. We'll take those. Feels like that should be the answer this time around. It's like, dude, just pick Mahomes. It's easy. It is. But man, the fact that it worked so well last year, not scoring real or fantasy points at a clip we know they're capable of. I'm going to say Stroud. After all of that gassing up Mahomes, I think I'm going to say Stroud. I, just, I don't think the Chiefs want to live that life again. Like th- there was a necessary evil that they embraced. And they're not gonna. They're not gonna live that life. Yeah, I, I bet that's a compelling argument. I, I will say that that they just got. They just trudged through and did what they had to do. Um, but man, it really worked. It worked. Really it, well. it really worked is the problem. It, I wish it didn't work. Didn't um, C.J. Stroud or, or Joseph Burrow, Denny? Uh, Stroud. Stroud. Kyle. Stroud. Wow, really? I don't know. Yeah. About that. I mean, you, okay. They both play seventeen games. You're that confident, C.J. Stroud's I mean, point Joe Burrow. I'm about that confident, but like. Yeah, Con- I think I'll still take Burrow to be honest. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, CJ Stroud, or I don't know, final one, I guess, uh, Lamar. Lamar. Oh, Lamar. I like Lamar, Lamar yeah. does the running thing. That's yeah. such a, I mean, Lamar. Also, Burrow, I mean, I know you said 17 games, but <laughs> let's, be, let's be real. <laughs> let's be real about it. The guy's playing nine, 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 ten max next year. Uh, uh, so, uh, are we confident Jalen Hurts will quote bounce back enough where he's still easily taken over CJ? Oh, the, the rushing is so crazy with him. Yeah. I'm yeah. Confident. I think he doesn't even need to bounce back. He could be like worse than last year. And I'm pretty sure he kind of smokes. Stroud. I think we've seen the peak of the Eagles rushing. No Jason Kelsey. We got the knee bone bruise for Jalen Hurts. I think they're going to be a, take a different approach this year. I really do. That would be, that would be terrible. It would be absolutely <laughs> devastating. Truly horrible. <laughs> truly, truly devastating. Devastating. The show's over, but it's time to go. I Check do. Out- Real quick, I have an update. Uh, Austin yeah, Eckroat has has double bogeyed eighteen. And- <laughs> no, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> Never been more over. Oh, and yeah. he is. Uh, so we got two double bogeys, uh, an eagle. Um, two and- double bogeys. Two double. Yeah, he bookended and- the whole round. So we're we're two over. We were one <laughs> under. Jeez. So it was it was over, and then we were back, and now it's over again. Oh man! What do you think the cut line is going to be tomorrow? <laughs> Oh, it, it could be. It could be two or three over. Man, Austin, you got some work to do Friday, man. Um, yeah. I wonder, his, he needs an early tea time. He needs to be one of those guys who's shot a 67 before I like, even open the app to check. Yeah, it. I'd love uh, that to happen because I don't want to sweat Austin Eck wrote. <laughs> producer, producer Adam says the, the cut line at the Masters could be as high as three over, which I believe because uh, he says that, you know, it's supposed to be windy later today. When I was doing my research last night, I was looking at various, you know, wind tracking apps and other, and things. And so trees. What, he was just looking at trees, and you're like, ah, oh, it looks. And, cool. and uh, no, here's here's what it said, Kyle. It said that the morning in the morning at Augusta, it was going to be 50 mile an hour winds, and it was going to be way way less wind in the afternoon. Now that's switched, so I'm done. 
you know? Well, it's nice that they play Augusta in uh, Lake Erie, Ohio. That's really cool well, of them. Uh, Augusta, Georgia was in the path of totality on Monday. Now it's weather patterns have totally changed. Uh, <laughs> I didn't no, project that. No one That's projected that. No one forecasted that. So good luck to everybody sweating the Masters. Um, good luck to our listeners who now have to wait four more days, but we'll be back on Tuesday. Um, so for Kyle Dvorak, for Denny Carter, I'm Patrick Darty. Seriously, thank you so much for listening, and we'll be back next week.